to find out if there was such a thing as um, as a poison that was undetectable, especially one that seemed to uh, mimic a heart attack that would kill someone, but it would it appear that they had a heart attack. I did find such a thing. Does this pistol uh, fire the dart? Yes, it does, Mr. Chairman, and a special one was developed which potentially would be able to uh, enter the target without perception. The, the poison was frozen into some sort of dart and then it was shot at uh, very high speed into the person so at, when it reached the person it would melt inside them and the only thing would be like one little tiny red dot on their body which was hard to detect. There wouldn't be a needle left or anything like that in the person. But also the toxin itself would not appear in the autopsy? Yes, so that uh, there was no, no way of perceiving that the, uh, the target was him. For many years I didn't even tell my friends I worked for CIA because I was embarrassed. It's colored my life, it always will. It's like a shadow that falls over my life all the time. It, I still, if I say anything against them, I turn around wondering if I'm being followed. I never even thought of joining the CIA. First of all, I thought I probably couldn't get in because it was considered the Cadillac of government agencies. And they mostly hired from um, Ivy League colleges. And I was uh, just out of high school, went right to work for Veterans Administration. And actually it was the, the typewriter repairman came in to repair my typewriter one day. And he said, you know, you shouldn't be working here. You should be working at a, a nicer place. They test you a lot. Huge testing. I mean, when, when you're put into this personnel pool, there's um, there are probably two or three weeks of tests where it's all day long, every single day. And there are IQ tests, there are personality tests. The questions that bothered me the most was when I took the polygraph test. And at and the polygraph test, they ask you such incredibly personal questions. For instance, they asked me if I was a virgin. And I was 18, and I thought, what business is it of theirs, whether I am or not? And I was rather embarrassed to tell them that I was, because I, I don't think any of my girlfriends were. <laughs> I was raised very strict. There were very few women at CIA who were other than secretaries. It was very sexist. It was, uh, it was the, the male establishment the white male establishment. I asked a couple of times why it was that there were no blacks there and why there were no gay people there, although they didn't call them gays in, that time, in those days. I think they called them queers in those days. And, um, and they said because homosexuals could not be cleared because they could be blackmailed. They said that uh, blacks couldn't be cleared because blacks just weren't, uh, they were just still too primitive. Too, they were just weren't usually smart enough and uh, they didn't have the kind of background that white people had. I mean, I didn't think that much at the time because it was like sort of standard operating procedure. But um, when I think about it now, I'm, I'm really quite shocked how you probably didn't even, would never get a job if you were black. I was assigned as a secretary in the audio surveillance division. There were experts on uh, listening devices and and uh, hidden microphones and that sort of thing. I did uh, also very often help the, um, the operatives get their, the, the documents that they needed. Once in a while I'd have to make a quick trip to um, the State Department to pick up their passports. And sometimes if we couldn't get the passports in time, then I'd have to go over to Graphic Arts Reproduction Division so that they could uh, forge one for them. Most of them were artists in there, but they were uh, recruited from uh, prisons because they were forgers and they were master forgers. They were people who knew how to forge money and uh, they forged all kinds of things. That's how they made their living. And so they would, the FBI would arrest them and then the CIA would come and spring them. <laughs> Then I went to uh, technical services where I was in charge of finding documents that were that you don't find in libraries, like 
Oh, like where you where you put explosives on a bridge. Where's the best place to put an explosive on a bridge? And, and what kind of explosive do you have to get that goes underwater without it, you know destroying its effectiveness? Uh, also, I had to find one time they wanted me to find um, to find out if there was such a thing as um, as a poison that was undetectable, especially one that seemed to uh, mimic a heart attack that would kill someone, but it would appear that they had a heart attack. I did find such a thing. Does this pistol uh, fire the dart? Yes, it does, Mr. Chairman. And a special one was developed, which potentially would be able to uh, enter the target without perception. The, the poison was frozen into some sort of dart, and then it was shot at uh, very high speed into the person. So at, when it reached the person, it would melt inside them. And the only thing would be like one little tiny red dot on their body, which was hard to detect. There wouldn't be a needle left or anything like that in the person. Have you brought with you um, some of those devices which would have enabled the CIA to use this poison for? We have indeed. For killing people? The round thing at the top is obviously the sight. It works by electricity. There's a battery in the handle, and it fires a small dart. And the dart itself, when it strikes the, the, the uh, target, um, does the uh, target know that he's, about, that he's been hit and about to die? A special one was developed, which potentially would be able to uh, enter the target without perception. As a murder instrument, that's about as efficient as you can get, isn't it? It, it? it is a weapon, a very serious weapon. But also the toxin itself would not appear in the autopsy? Yes, so that uh, there was no, no way of perceiving that the, uh, the target was him. I think the first time that I seriously questioned anything that was more than... I just couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> was when I came across this document, it was, it was, it was eyes only. And it was to my boss, but he only had one hand and a hook in the other hand, so I always opened all of his mail and his packages and so forth. And this one, he wasn't in the office, I opened it and I read it. It said eyes only, I wanted to read it, because I wasn't supposed to probably. And it was a, a report about a mission where they had blown up a bridge in Asia somewhere and uh, they had killed a number of women and children who were on their way to market in that, that morning. It was re reported as though they were really proud, mission accomplished. That one bothered me a lot. When my boss came in, I gave him his mail and I mentioned this and I said, this is wrong. These women hadn't done anything. These children didn't deserve to die. Why did we do that? And he said, it's, uh, that's the fortunes of war. And I said, but we're not at war. We're certainly not at war in that country. Why did we do that? I don't understand it. And he said, well, you're very young. When you get older, you'll understand those things. I think probably all of us became addicted to the danger, to the intrigue. It was, um, it was living a fantasy. It was actually living a fantasy and being on the inside. And it was very hard to leave, even though I felt that they did wrong and I would never, ever work for an agency like that now because I, I realized that I wasn't, it wasn't because I was a child or I was so young, it was because it was wrong. But uh, at the time, it was really exciting after that, there was no other job I could have ever again in my life that would be that exciting. I knew that.